Okay, so a long time ago, people thought that forces of electricity and magnetism were completely unrelated. They thought that these two forces had as much as common as, oh, I don't know, a rhino with wings. However, in the mid-1800s, a guy by the name of James Clerk Maxwell decided that magnetism and electricity were extremely similar, and set about trying to unite the two apparently different forces. He succeeded, and came up with the eight equations that described the way that magnetism and electricity were related. Later, in 1864, he wrote a paper, A Dynamic Theory of the Electromagnetic Field. Maxwell wrote, The agreement of the results seems to show that light and magnetism are affections of the same substance, and that light is an electromagnetic disturbance propagated through the field according to electromagnetic laws. So basically, this is just a fancy way of saying that light is a form of electromagnetic radiation. All is well and good, right? Makes sense? Okay, light equals electromagnetic radiation. However, there was a technical snag. One of the results of Maxwell's theory is that the electromagnetic disturbances travel at a fixed and never changing speed. This constant speed? The speed of light, or about 2.9979 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. On the surface, this makes sense. After all, light is an electromagnetic disturbance, and therefore it should travel at the speed of light. Duh. Um, I'm gonna take a slight diversion here and clarify something about the speed of light. 2.9979 times 10 to the 8th is the speed of light in a vacuum. When light enters a substance like air or glass, its speed is reduced because, well, the molecules, whatever substance it just entered, are impeding its progress, like dropping a rock into water. You can see this when you stick a straw into a glass of water and it looks like the straw is bent, or has been cut in two. However, this change in the speed of light has no effect on special relativity, so I'm just gonna ignore it, and so are you. Anyway, but... Yeah, the speed of light is a constant and will never change, in a vacuum. So, it should make sense, right? Light moves at the speed of light. Well, a young man named Albert Einstein wondered what would happen if you chased after a beam of light at light speed. According to Newton and intuition, if the two velocities of two things are equal and they are traveling in the same direction, then the distance between them doesn't change. From the perspective of the observer traveling at the speed of light, light is standing still. But wait, we just said light always travels at the speed of light. It never changes. It is a constant. Why is it suddenly standing still? According to Maxwell's theory and all experimental data, there is no such thing as stationary light. Einstein solved this problem with his theory of special relativity. That was one big circle. And you haven't learned anything but an annoying paradox. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about perspective for a bit. Perspective is very important to special relativity. From the perspective of a passenger in a car on a highway with really, really smooth suspensions, a tree on the side of a highway is moving. But according to a hitchhiker standing on the shoulder of the road, the tree is stationary. Okay, so another way of saying this is that according to the driver of the car, his hood ornament is stationary. But according to the hitchhiker, the ornament is really traveling at the speed of the car. This is what we see, but our experiences with the world tell us what really is going on. And we know that the speed sometimes changes according to the perspective of the person observing it. In physics terms, frame of reference. But according to special relativity, there are extremely small and subtle changes that are occurring here that we are not seeing. Special relativity states that two different observers in different states of motion will have different perceptions of distance and time. So if you're standing in a park and a friend comes running up to you, you will both disagree at the exact size of his shoe and how long it took for him to reach you. Special relativity says that your perception of time will change according to your state of motion. It is an intrinsic property of time itself. The variable here is how fast you're moving compared to the speed of light. Compared to the speed of light, most velocities that people observe are extremely small. So therefore, none of us can really observe special relativity at work in our everyday lives, simply because no one is traveling fast enough to be compared to the speed of light. Let me give you an example of special relativity in action. There's this guy named Slim and he knows this guy named Jim. So Slim buys a sports car from Jim and goes to a local drag strip. Slim then proceeds to speed down the strip at 120 miles per hour as Jim watches from the sidelines with a stopwatch to time him. Let's pretend that Slim doesn't really trust Jim because he's a car dealer after all and has a stopwatch of his own in the car and times himself. If both Slim and Jim accurately measure the time it took for the car to cover the strip, they will find that their observations will differ if Jim, standing on the sidelines, measured exactly 30 seconds, 
Then according to special relativity, Slim and the speeding car will find his time to be 29.9995952 seconds. There are 12 nines in the decimal portion of that number. No wonder special relativity is not observed in normal life. In the same way, Jim and Slim will find the lengths of the car to be different. Let's say that Jim uses a clever trick to measure the length of the car. He starts his stopwatch when the front of the car reaches a certain point on the strip and stops his stopwatch after the back of the car passes that point. Since Jim is smart and knows his conversion factors, he knows that if he takes the speed of the car, 120 miles per hour, and multiplies it by the amount of time in hours that it took for the front and the back of the car to cross that point, he will find the length of the car in miles. If the user's manual of the car states that the car is exactly 16 feet long, then Jim will find the car to be 15.9974 feet long. Again, and coincidentally, there are 12 nines in the decimal portion of that number. This difference is pretty small. This shows how the effects of special relativity are unnoticeable in everyday life. However, if Slim is somehow able to juice up his car so that he is now traveling at 580 million miles per hour, that's about 87% of the speed of light, instead of a pathetic 120 miles per hour, he will observe the length of his car to be about 8 feet long instead of 16. Pretty big difference. The uh, jargon for those changes is time dilation and Lorenz contraction. This is an example of special relativity at work, but why and how does it work that way? Well, special relativity stems from two things, the properties of light and the abstract idea of um, relativity. Let's talk about relativity first, since it's just cool. Relativity is simple, really. Whenever we talk about speed or velocity of an object, we usually specify, or at least imply, to what the object's speed is being compared. For example, when you say a car is traveling at 50 miles per hour, you're saying the car is traveling at 50 miles per hour compared to the surface of the road. This idea has vast implications. Let me give you a more profound example. Okay, so there's this guy named George. He's an astronaut, though a bored one, but he has a very awesome flashlight with red lens, so it's emitting red light. From what we can see, he's very, very, very far away from everything else. Stars are distant. Galaxies look like minuscule whirls. There's nothing close to him at all, just the blackness of cosmos. Then, out of the blackness, he sees a green light coming his way. Eventually, it gets close enough for him to see that a fellow astronaut is holding a flashlight with a green lens. This astronaut, named Gracie, waves, and George waves back. Gracie flips away, retreating into the cosmos. Now, let's tell the story from Gracie's point of view. Okay, so here's a gal named Gracie. She's an astronaut, though a bored one, but she has this very awesome flashlight with a green lens, so it's emitting a green light. From what she can see, she's very, very, very far away from anything else. The stars are distant. Galaxies look like minuscule whirls. There's nothing close to her at all. Just the blackness of the cosmos. Then suddenly, out of the blackness, she sees a red light coming her way. Eventually, it gets close enough for her to see that a fellow astronaut is holding a flashlight with a red lens. Gracie waves, and this astronaut, named George, waves back. George floats away, retreating into the cosmos. Both points of view are equally valid. Both George and Gracie feel like they are stationary and that the other astronaut is moving. This is because the only frame of reference they have is themselves, and because they don't feel any acceleration, they think that they are stationary. It is the other astronaut that is moving, not themselves. This example captures the entire principle of relativity. The concept of motion is relative. We can only talk about the motion of an object in relation to that of another. Constant velocity motion is relative, not so much for accelerated motion. For people who don't know the difference between velocity and acceleration, again, consider a car. This pedometer measures your velocity, how fast you are going at that instant. Nothing in your car really measures your acceleration. The rotations per minute dial kind of does, but not really. Acceleration is change in velocity. If you turn on your cruise control, then you should feel no acceleration. When you accelerate, hint hint, like your car does, when a red light turns green, you can feel the acceleration. So, to repeat myself, constant velocity motion is relative. Not so for accelerated motion.